Hey, you sister students, this is Mr. Baker. How are you doing? Great. This is Baker's Corner. We're actually moving into our, <clears throat> our uh, next time period or theme, which is our Second World War. And so if you look at my screen, you'll notice that we're actually going to be looking at a very broad period of time. So we're going to be doing this in three or four installments. And we are going to kind of look at the in-between war period or the uh, kind of like the interwar periods, if you will, between World War I and World War II. And my question, guys, to all of you to think about is what usually comes to mind if you have any knowledge at all of World War II, okay? Uh, it's a war that there's a lot of causes to it. There's tons of debate about its place in history. Um, you go back and you talk to people, just a real quick note on this, um, you know, that, that obviously have researched it, lived during it, and of course written about it extensively. You'll a lot of times hear people mention that this group – of people, Americans, particularly in our case, guys, that uh, came out of this war is a lot of times labeled as the greatest generation of Americans. Interesting, given that many of them lived, of course, during the Great Depression and also, of course, World War II. So there's a lot of sacrifice. Okay. So I want you guys to think back to a few lessons ago or units when we talked about the end of World War I. So, you know, a lot of us are like, okay, well, Versailles Treaty was a couple of weeks ago as far as our conversation. Why is it important to keep in mind? And the reason is, guys, is that history is a building block, okay? So if you take a look here, guys, you'll notice the end of World War I um, is going to bring about a lot of change. But this is what pretty much the, 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 uh, the, the, um, the nations of Europe look like prior to that treaty. And so what do we notice? We notice empires that eventually are broken down into several different places and in many cases, um, different countries. So you've got Poland, Czechoslovakia, which eventually is broken further in, in the early 90s. You've got Austria and Hungary, Yugoslavia. Up here, it's not labeled, but you've got Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. All right, so guys, there's a lot of change. So this treaty is gonna have a dramatic effect on the direction of how Europe is organized. Moving forward, okay? And so moving into the 1920s, Germany is going through a lot of a lot of problems economically, politically. They make this transition, guys, to this Weimar Republic, okay, which is basically going to be replacing the previous government that they had that had the, the Kaiser and all that, okay. And so they're going to have a president by the name of Paul von Hindenburg, who was a very well-known World War I uh, general, okay. And eventually what happens, they go through a lot of problems. They hit rock bottom economically much before the Great Depression time period that we looked at briefly last time. Okay. And so the question is, guys, moving forward is what also happens to the Middle East? Well, it's going to be broken into different pieces as well. So you're going to notice a lot of these areas that had been under Ottoman influence are now going to be divided into Turkey, which is north of here. You've got Lebanon, you've got Syria, Iraq, Transjordan, and then also, as you can see, Palestine. Now, if you look here, guys, you'll notice that these places actually have European uh, powers beside them, and that's because they're going to be heavily influenced. And think about, guys, what this is, why this is going to be important. They're going to be influenced culturally through things like language, et cetera, all right, maybe even religion to an extent. Okay, they're going to be influenced by things like political structures, right? Um, and so this is a big, big deal because World War II is going to involve most of these places to, of course, a pretty significant level. Okay, so what are some major causes of World War II? Um, you can pause the screen if you need to, but these five, I think, guys, are a very big picture set of things. But guys, what I want you to be able to explain is not just identify, okay, isolation was there, but how, right? The how, why, when, where, and what, okay? So isolationism, what happens? The United States goes into a period of kind of like withdrawal in some way. So we're not gonna be heavily involved with the world beyond things like trade. We are gonna be negotiating some armed reduction or limit treaties, okay, that are gonna limit things like naval size, you know, military size, et cetera. Okay. But for the most part, guys, this policy is going to be very, very important to America in this post-war period after World War One. 
harshness of the Versailles Treaty. Why is that a major cause? I once had one person tell me, guys, or at least I've heard it before, that, you know, what the harshness did, you know, it took away a lot of German production. It took away a lot of German pride. All right, the list goes on and on. And so, guys, if you're basically going to be um, pushing a rat or at least an animal into a corner, if you will, it is usually going to come back ferocious and bite you. And that's kind of what the harshness of this treaty did. It did not create a peace without victory using, of course, Woodrow Wilson's terms. And so Germany is going to eventually see um, a very strong uh, totalitarian leadership, as we'll see here more in a moment. Okay. And the end result of that, ladies and gentlemen, is that they're going to have uh, a lot of policies that are going against the treaty, right? Worldwide depression in the late 20s and 30s. Hate to burst everybody's bubble, guys, but the world, the depression that we associate with our country, the United States, is not unique to the United States. Okay. So it's going to be worldwide in many cases. A lot of different things are happening that are going to affect, you know, Germany, Italy, places like that. Okay. And then the rise of totalitarian governments. I want you all to think what comes to mind when you think of the term totalitarian. It doesn't sound really positive most of the time. So what comes to mind? Total control, total power, you know, perhaps leadership that's going to really take the bull by the horns as the saying goes. Okay. And so these are going to be countries, guys, that are on, that are going to un, be under a degree of forceful leadership, very organized, very structured. Okay. In a lot of cases, guys, and especially in the case of Nazi Germany and fascist Italy, um, you notice a lot of, and even Japan too, as well, you see a lot of emphasis on nationalism, guys, building the spirits of the people up in difficult times, Germany, uh, et cetera. And then last but not least, as we'll look at more in a second, guys, the term appeasement to Hitler's expansion policy. Okay. Hitler, guys, when he starts to take control of different parts of Czechoslovakia, he annexes Austria-Hungary. We'll see that in a second. Okay. He is essentially violating what treaty? Versailles. I mean, it's not rocket science. It is clear that he's doing that. But what does it mean to appease him? It means that pretty much, guys, countries like France, Britain, et cetera, they're giving in for the purpose of avoiding another large-scale war. Well, the problem is, guys, if you think about it, is if you basically lengthen the leash, okay, you're basically giving people more power. I think it was one of John F. Kennedy's um, advisors, maybe a Secretary of State during the Cuban Missile Crisis when they were trying to get this issue uh, figured out so we don't have a, a major you know, nuclear war. And he made a comment. He said, appeasement usually makes the aggressor more aggressive. And there's probably a little bit of truth to that. Why? Because you're giving in to their demands and you're not putting your foot down to make them change course with their behavior. Okay. You're welcome to stop your screen here. Um, but just a real quick thing, guys. When we're looking at the rise of totalitarian governments, you're going to see the rise of Nazi Germany. You're going to see the rise of Benito Mussolini's fascism in Italy. Some people call this just imperialism in, in um, Japan. Okay. And then also, guys, Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union. Now, keep in mind, eventually the Soviet Union will be fighting against the Axis powers. Okay. However, there is an interesting story that leads up to eventually Germany and, and Soviet Union eventually fighting against each other. And that is they actually signed a treaty over um, the partition of Poland. It was called the Nazi Soviet Non-Aggression Pact. I believe they signed that in the later 30s. Um, and a lot of people guys are like, well, both leaders, did they really intend to keep the agreement? Um, I would say in my estimation, probably not. It was a more a matter of probably, um, who would invade first and who did it's going to be the blitzkrieg invasion of Poland by you guessed it, Hitler. Okay. So what things are going to define like Nazism and fascism? Extremes for extreme forms of nationalism. Usually one party rule. All right. So you're phasing out multiple parties. 
Um, you're also usually going to have guys the idea of complete allegiance to the state. Anything that interferes with your ability, guys, to direct the state is usually not going to be well received. Now, in the case of Nazi Germany, that could be anything from perhaps, you know, a copy of the Declaration of Independence or English Bill of Rights or something like that. Okay. And uh, you can see exactly why we're going at. Why are they going to do that? They want the people to be 100% committed to the state. If you didn't know this, guys, they had a pro-natalist policy. If you're wondering what in the world Mr. Baker is pro-natalist, that is a fancy way of saying that they encouraged a larger population growth. And they would actually give medals to the women that would actually have the most kids, particularly sons. Okay. So that's kind of a form of nationalism. Hey, you know, you're contributing to the possibility of a larger military down the line, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So you notice a lot of this now, uh, a lot of this nationalism. And what about Japan? Well, guys, this greater East Asia coast prosperity sphere, take a look at this map. What is Japan essentially trying to do? And the big idea here is, all right, they want to control most of Asia. Why? And a lot of us are like, well, okay, they're going to invade and successfully conquer Manchuria and rename it Manchuko. They're going to eventually control Korea, as you can see. That'll be a big hot spot when the war is over, by the way, if you didn't know that. All right, they're eventually going to take control of French Indochina. We today refer to that as Vietnam. And they're eventually going to invade China. As you can see, they conquer a, a pretty decent piece of China. Not, of course, the whole thing, but certainly a piece of it. Okay. What is the big picture goal here? What does Japan need? Well, remember, it's kind of uh, it's kind of like isolated a little bit as far as some of its you know resources and things like that. You could say um, it needs resources, it needs raw materials to make a war machine possible. Okay, so guys, they're looking at these places as opportunities, and that's kind of what imperialism does in one respect, right? You're controlling other areas. Why? Because they have some degree of strategic value. Okay. What about Hitler? Well, take a look at this again, aggression. So he became the, uh, the, the, the chancellor of Germany, January 30th of 1933. He was appointed to that position, I believe it was by Paul von Hindenburg, who I mentioned just a moment ago. Okay. And what does he do? Well, he basically occupies the Rhineland. I know I won't cover all these guys. You're welcome to stop the screen. Um, and a lot of you are like, well, Mr. Baker, you know, you're, the Rhineland used to be a part of Germany, what happened? Well, the, the Treaty of Versailles. It's supposed to be a demilitarized zone. No military present. It's supposed to be pretty much a buffer zone between uh, France and Germany to kind of limit the kind of invasion that happened going back to World War I. Okay. And so what does Hitler do? He invades it. What happens? Not much. So they kind of hold off. Then he invades Austria through the Anschluss, which is basically annexation, leave his realm, growing space, if you will. And I think it's interesting, guys, how he moves forward with Czechoslovakia. So you'll notice he doesn't do this all at once. All right, so he annexes, you know, takes control, makes it a part of Germany in bits and pieces. Now, I want to draw your attention, guys, to Slo Slovakia, which is right here. Okay. So as you can see here, this is going to be one of the last of the three or four pieces of this particular area. So why would he do that? And the answer is, ladies and gentlemen, because he wants to basically control areas that in some cases were, you guessed it, of German descent. And the argument is, okay, you're German people, therefore you should be able to have German government basically govern you. Now, again, this is a clear violation of the Versailles Treaty. But Germany and France eventually put their foot down, at least they try to, at the Munich Pact. And they say, okay, we're giving you this last piece of Czechoslovakia. But they put, they put a stipulation there and they said, okay, this is the last straw. No more aggression, no more places. Now, guys, you know as well as I do, if you have a leader like Hitler that has an ego about the size of your room and larger, he is usually not going to stop there, and he doesn't, which leads us to, you guessed it, the eventual start of World War II. Okay, 
So what happens? So Hitler basically eventually invades September 1st of 1939, Poland. So you can see that guy's right here. Why is this a big deal? He has violated the Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact. The Soviet Union, as you can see, is eventually going to be on guard. As you can see, it's a huge country, largest um, in the world. Okay, And so Germany, as you can see, is going to um, actually say, well, let's invade Poland. Okay. But guys, I want you to take a note here that you don't see a lot of this invasion further eastward until 1941. And the reason being, guys, if you take a look, is that Hitler says, okay, we've gotten Poland. We don't want to you know, maybe uh, create too many issues for the Soviet Union for now. So what do we do? We actually start to focus on France and also, as you can see, Norway and Denmark. And so he conquers those areas pretty, pretty quickly, at least part of them. Okay. And guys, what does he do? He basically goes and conquers Paris. And it's an interesting story, guys, because if you do the research, you'll come across that. I, I want to say there was a, a campaign of World War I. If you go back to the Western Front, they're trying to get people out there to defend France. They took one of the, I think it was like a car or some kind of train car or something like that. And they actually created kind of like a monument of World War I to kind of remember it. From what I understand, guys, when Hitler conquers Paris, you can see that right there, he actually forces the Paris and the French uh, leadership to actually sign the agreement in that car. So again, peace without victory did not work, right? Because of the harshness. Okay. So what does he do? He says, okay, France, you're pretty much done with a few exceptions here. A little bit of, of um, going back to that later on. And he focuses his eyes on Great Britain. Now guys, what have we not mentioned extensively in this lesson? The United States. But remember what I said before, guys, with World War I, this Atlantic Ocean is still the same size because of technology, because of things like that. The protection it's going to provide is going to be vastly different. Does Hitler ever conquer Great Britain? And the answer is no. Um, very interesting story, guys. If you ever want to watch a wonderful film called The King's Speech, that won Oscar awards. It's a very interesting um, story. If you go back to the King of England, who basically was um, uh, somebody who really struggled with his public speaking and things. And guys, if you watch the movie, which is really well done, um, eventually at the end of the movie, you know, as Britain is being pummeled, and you know, of course, uh, as a lot of you guys know, Winston Churchill is the Prime Minister of Britain then. Um, but this king gets up you know, on radio, of course, and basically eventually makes a speech of his life. And Britain never folded. The Royal Air Force is going to be extremely good with defending. And a lot of you guys are like, okay, Mr. Baker, why is it such a big deal? We'll go back to what happens here. So Hitler is thinking, okay, I'm not probably going to successfully conquer the British, I'm then going to focus my attention further eastward and also, as you can see here, south. Does he ever conquer Russia or the Soviet Union? What do you notice? He makes some progress, but he got within about 60 miles of Moscow. Never conquer Moscow. And guys, the reason for this, if you take a look at my cursor, the Soviets, we know that their population was pretty was a, a pretty large population. They actually created kind of like a series of shields. So they would have like a shield here with people. They would have another one that was a little bit further westward. And then they would have another one that is a certain amount of uh, distance from the Polish border. As Germany was actually going eastward, as each one of those kind of li lines were depleting, they would actually fall back. Okay, so they were constantly having a line that was gaining in size. And so, guys, what I understand is that that's one of the bigger reasons why they never conquer Moscow. However, as we'll see, guys, in one of our future lessons, this does have a dramatic effect on the United States. All right. Why? Because we're going to have to basically come to some degree of terms with the Soviet Union when they're the countries that, lo that has lost about 20 million people 
which is a little bit less than one, I'm sorry, which is a little bit less than 40% of the entire World War II death population. Many of which, by the way, were civilians. Okay. Where are we going to pick up next time? For those of you that will see uh, part two, we're going to start to look guys at this transition of the United States from a time of, uh, of isolation to eventually a time of declared war. Hope you've had a good session. I know I have. This is Baker's Corner. Feel free to email me if you have any questions. Otherwise, stay safe, and I will see you in part two when we pick up with American Entry. Take care. Bye-bye.